thanks for joining us tonight. Hopefully you're in the right place. We're going to be discussing hill weather lambs. Are they a byproduct or an opportunity for our industry? Um, I'm Emma Steele and I'm the Knowledge Exchange Manager um, for the Midlands and I've been involved with um, our group during the project tonight. I'll ask our speakers Tim, Barry and Kate to introduce themselves shortly but firstly I'm going to pass to my colleague Sam to introduce her herself, the tech and how to ask questions. Good evening everyone and thank you for, for joining us. Um, as Emma said I've also been um, involved in this this group and this project, also Knowledge Exchange from the North East. Um, so really great opportunity to talk about what we've been doing tonight with you all. Just to quickly run through the tech, um, Emma will be running through um, the talk this evening and I'll be looking after you guys with regards to the question. So if you can't see your question box at the moment, then you'll need to press the orange arrow button, which is which is essentially a minimize button. So if you can't see that, click on there. And then if you click on the questions drop down, you will see the questions box and where you're able to type your question in. And then if we just um, have a go at how that works. Emma, if you can click to the next screen and we'll see. Yeah, so if we can all just test that that question system's working, we're just gonna run a bit of a poll. Um, so what's the best time to run internet events such as these? Is it A, 9.30 a.m. to 11 a.m. in the morning? Is it B, 12.30 p.m. till 2 p.m.? C, 4 till 5.30 or D, 7 till 8.30 p.m.? So can some or all of you have a go, please, at just typing into that question box, A, B, C or D? Excellent, there's some coming through. Okay, Something's brilliant. working, so great. <laughs> We're all good, Emma. Please do ask questions throughout tonight. You don't have to wait till the end um, to be able to do this. Sam will be interjecting at the appropriate points to ask your questions for you. Um, you will remain muted throughout the call. We're going to aim to finish earlier than 9pm um, if we can, but that depends on the questions. The more involved um, you get, the better it'll be. And this will be recorded so you can listen to it later. As far as an agenda um, for the evening, we're going to first talk about the project a little bit um, that all three of our speakers have been involved in. And then we're going to talk about the breeding, health and finishing of hill weather lambs. And ultimately, I'll ask our speakers to answer the question, um, are hill weathers a byproduct or an opportunity for our industry? What I will just mention at this point is we're going to stop briefly at 8 p.m. Um, to clap for our key workers. So. Without me going on for any longer, Tim, can you just introduce yourself and your farm, please? Yeah. Hi, I'm Tim Doan. I farm with my wife, Sarah, <clears throat> and our son, James, at Breckhouse in Bransdale, which is in the middle of the North York Moors. Um, we trade as Breckhouse Enterprises. We have 350 acres of in-by ground and a lot of very hard black moor. Uh, moorland which is very well suited to Swaledale sheep. We keep 1,350 Swaledale yows, um, a small flock of blue-faced Leicesters and a small flock <coughs> of mules that we use as recipients for the blue-faced Leicester embryos that we flush. We breed all our own replacements. We turn 700 plus to the Swaledale tub and approximately 550 to the blue-faced Leicester. Um, I think that's about me introduced. We also run a pregnancy scanning service for, for sheep or anything you can hold still, basically. <laughs> I'm intrigued now as to what you've been scanning that's not a sheep. <laughs> I'll, I'll, tell you when, I'll tell you when I you're old enough. <laughs> <laughs> Harry, I'm going to move on to you next. Can you uh, do the I same and very... introduce yourself? Hi, I'm Barry Weldon. I uh, also farm the North York Moors. Um, also run sheep on the same hill land as Tim on the open common there. We have about 26 head of cattle, um, about 530 lowland yows that make made up of Texel crosses, Aberfield crosses, um, North of England mules and Glyn crosses. Um, run about 
200 in by Swedes that are put to a blue face Leicester on Aberfield Ram on Auto Charolais, and then we have 470 pure Swedes that we uh, run as nucleus block out on the moor. Uh, they are put, all put to Swedes Rams, and they're all record all recorded in this project. Uh, we lamb about from Lowland ewes lamb 1st of April, and the moor ewes pure Swedes lamb from the 29th of April. So we lamb a bit later, and that's about uh, that's about it from me. And Kate yourself? Uh, yeah, I'm Kate Phillips. I'm an independent sheep consultant working across the, well, not quite the UK, England and Wales, really. Um, my involvement with the project was very much to look at um, lamb finishing and take it on from where the farmers have been um, doing all the genetic work and, and recording um, and see where we um, sort of land in terms of improving carcass confirmation of these lambs. So, um, yeah, it's been great, great fun to be involved in this group and <laughs> headed up to North Yorkshire on several occasions. Um, been a really good project to be involved in. Sorry, can I just interrupt for just a second? Um, I've had some questions coming through about sound. Can can um, those that can hear us, can they just type yes in the questions box, please? Just check that some of you have got sound. Yes, OK. Um, so if any of you haven't got sound, can I suggest you dial out and dial back in again? Um, and just check the audio when you log back in that it's using your computer's audio. Um, because we do have a lot of people that can hear. Sorry, sorry to interrupt. Thank you. Thanks. Not a problem. Thanks, Sam. So, thank you. Um, I'm going to move on to the project a little bit um, now. So, Tim, can you explain what the project is and what you did as a group for me? Yeah, <clears throat> the project um, we set up because we wanted to look at the and improve the carcass of the Swelldale. Um, initially, it was a three-year project set up uh, by Steve Dunkley of HDB, and the project has been run, and uh, we've had a lot of help from HDB all along the way. We started with four members um, in the project, and we've expanded to six members now. Um, we the, during the project we've we've done the single sire mating, we've done the weighing of lambs at birth, we've done the eight week weights, the twenty one week weights, and the back fat scanning. In year one, tups were shared with two tups were shared on on our farm and Barry's farm. In year two, the same two tups were tried on a third farm. Very interesting results. Um, for each year of the project we've held an open day so we've had three open days which have been well attended and very positive we've also run finishing trials within the project um also highlighted a lot of interesting data okay thanks Tim. so why was the project needed the uh i felt the project was needed because we as i go around on my scanning round I, I was becoming aware that there was a lot of people were trying different breeds quite often at the expense of the north of england mill um which when i asked quite a bit of the criticism was pointed towards the swaledale and as i'm a massive fan of swaledales and north of england mills this caused me great concern and i felt as though something needed needed to be done um not just to, to uh, help sell the meal gimme lambs, but also maybe make more out of our weather lambs and and stand a better chance of selling our tubs. So basically that's where it started. We you know we, we set off at our own district AGM and uh, made inquiries from there and Sam Byrne from Signet came along and introduced himself and and we went from there, yeah. Rest is history. Yeah. <laughs> um so that's quite clear as to why the project was needed and why you wanted to be involved. Barry, why did you want to be involved? Um, I identified that the um, the hill lambs were our poorest for poorest performance financially, and I thought that um, something had to be done to improve the profitability of them. Um, so uh, we started playing about with um, recording weights uh, about five years ago. Five years ago, I think now. 
and there were and just um, playing about with weight gains uh, with some electronic equipment that I'd, I'd gotten hold of, and there were falling behind the lowland breeze as you would expect, but just a matter of trying to finish finish finishing our own lambs, just trying to get them to finish like quicker and um, using less inputs really. So I'm trying to make more of the uh, of the grass that we've got. So uh, we thought that we should try and breed these swerdos that will fatten a little bit better, as um, either sell them as stars or um, or sell them fat yourself. It would just increase the try and increase the income from uh, our moorland flock really. So that was uh, that was the main reason for um, for the project. Um, so yeah, I thought there was um, definitely room for a, a 50 kilo yow. Uh, hill yow that would could produce a lamb that would fatten easily on lowland ground, and uh, you can't fatten dead lambs. So something that's easy lambing, like a swaledale, a good mother in believe that's very difficult to breed in. It's easy to breed in terminal traits, and it's to breed in maternal ones. So I thought we'd start with the the, the swaledale was what we had on farm. So we um, so we thought well we'll just in, if we improve the terminal traits of the swaledale a bit, make them easier finishing. It's uh, it will be a win win situation. Sam, have we got any questions coming through yet? Nope, not yet. Everybody's very <laughs> quiet. <laughs> we'll carry on then. Tim, do you want to let us know what you've done with the signet recording and what data it is you collect, kind of from start to finish? Um, basically, the, the year starts at, at tupping time when we record all our yows. Um, obviously, the single sire mated, so we, we enter the number of our tub into the RD reader and read all the hours and then when it comes to lambing time um it's up the reader's already got all the information so when we weigh the lamb we enter the weight we enter the date of the birth and it, it, it does all the rest for us um and the data as swaledale breeders we're already recording the parentage of these lambs um, and putting tags in their ears telling us what who their father is and we know their mother and their grandmother and all this lot so it seems logical to try and get more use out of these out of this recording that we've been doing for years um, with very with a, with very little extra work to be fair so getting weighing the lambs at eight weeks is pretty much ties in with when we're shearing um do you, she do you can have to weigh. get each lamb do you have to get each lamb in on its eighth birthday or is it a bit more flexible no this was uh, this was one thing that we we inquired at the start. Was it strict that there had to be eight weeks of of age? And that is not true. Um, you can weigh them between six and twelve weeks. So of course that allows for quite a if you've a lengthy lambing, which often more sheep are, um, it allows us a bit of leeway. So because we we start lambing the first of May with our swaledales, and as we're gathering for shearing that. That ties in well for us to take the eight week eight week weights, and then the twenty one week weights. Um, by then they're off the moor, they're weaned, so they're handy to get, and uh, do the weighing for the twenty one week weight and the back fat scanning, and the data when we get it all comes in this book. <clears throat> and believe me, when you get that book, you can't put it down for a little bit. <laughs> um, a lot of good information and really brings home a lot of what you think how your tubs are getting that book confirms it and backs it up um also on the just before i go any further on the project as well that there is going to be a final there has been a final report done if uh, defra approve it that's available for anybody to see um on the hd website so all the information that, that the data that we've gathered will be available there for people to see yeah we're just we're just waiting on approval for that so it's not quite up there yet but yeah you're right That's it will right. be yeah <laughs> um <coughs> barry so are you starting to see differences on farm from all this data you're collecting oh yeah for sure definitely um you always, uh, you always, your eyes are always drawn to the uh, biggest and best in the group. But um, when you start working, when you start getting adjusted weight, so that they're all, so that uh, signal will provide you with an adjusted eight-week weight for a start, which is you was, you've got a birth weight when they're born, and then it's worked out in days, to and it makes them 
and it weighs it, it uh, works out the growth rate per day and then it produces you a an eight week adjusted weight so if all the lambs are exactly 56 days old that would be the weight that they get and it um and that um that for that uh, sort of evens the keel most usually good lambs tend to stand out and they are usually high performing lambs but some of the smaller twin lambs that it takes into account when we're recording that you maybe that your eyes wouldn't be drawn to are also uh, singled out with the um, recording uh, uh, you can single out lambs like that but um yeah you definitely would definitely increase seeing increases in growth rates by using a higher um higher growth ebv rams definitely the um there's the difference in the um there's a the slide that Emma's put up there. She's um, the this is a uh, these are two rams off the farm off uh, one of the neighbours' farms, uh, and it just shows the difference in the in the weight gain between two average weight gains and the av average loin depths of two rams, and the difference that makes financially just in the weight gains uh, is um, considerable, and also in the loin depth, it's just basically the uh, eye muscle on your chop. So it shows that you're producing more meat for that carcass, and also fat, loin fat. It shows a fat that you can breed rams that produce fatter lambs, so they'll finish easier. So um, yes, the um, you definitely can see an improvement on farm. And has it changed the way you think about rams and your breeding stock selection? Yeah, definitely. Um, we used 40% of our rams were fully re were recorded last year. Uh, I've been either involved in the project or have been born into the project and then used within it as shillings. And then the um, and the um, sorry, I've gone blank. What did you say? It's all right. Has it changed the way you think about your ram selection? Oh yeah, yeah. yeah. The um, we use the we we use a. We use recorded rams now, and we would we would definitely rely more on figures. We'd still obviously select for teeth, uh, and looks also come into it as well. You, you can't breed breed things that aren't just a type. So we but we also use them as an, another tool in our kit to just to help just to, just another selection issue, another selection tool to pick which sheep you might want to keep for breeding, which ones you wouldn't. To be honest, the it's definitely. Change how we uh, look at our rams. Tim, has it changed the way you're thinking about your breeding stock? Yeah, yeah, it definitely has. Um, the you do get tups, obviously, you identify as your top tups. But for me, um, it's a long-term project. Is this? But in year one, you do identify which tups are getting your lambs that have the slowest growth rates. And for me, it's eliminating those where we can make a quick gain at the start and then build on that as we go forward. Um, that, that's a big one for me is getting rid of the getting rid of the, the rubbish, basically. Did you just want to ex explain this slide that's up a little bit, um, Tim? Yeah, yeah. Obviously, in in the it explains there we've got 77, uh, 67 rams that we use in the project, um, and obviously the higher index ones, it's easier to concentrate on the higher index ones. But the the, the box highlights the the bottom half, um, and those are the ones that I would concentrate on, um, not using at all or not using as much at all if 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 you have a say if you've got a tub that's getting very typey lambs that you you like the look of them and if they're if he's performing poorly as in growth rates you could use him lightly but you must uh the way i look at it you must get his females to a high index ram in the future that's how you can you can you can keep it tight um, but yeah, it's that bottom half that I think we need to to eliminate if we can, or, or definitely lift them. So, do you think it's more important to be looking at those, or at least equally important, to be looking at those bottom ones as the top ones? Then, I think it's I think it's important to look at the top ones because um, you, you, as a human being, you always want to look at the best. But I think when you uh, I've been bred in shape a few years and you, you tend to also look at your worst and it's the ones that get get your worst that you want rid of. That, that That's the one that lifts your average, that's the way I look at it. 
Sam's popped up, which means we've either got a question or something's broken. <laughs> a bit of both. No, it's not. It's not. No, we've got we've got questions. Um, yeah, just just on Tim's final point there, that some questions already coming through around um, how powerful is that information in terms of getting rid of your rubbish, um, which I think you've you've just come to, when actually you can see quick gains by that in itself sometimes, can't you? Um, and then just to go back a step, we had a question around lamin systems. Obviously, you're both outdoor lammers. Um, yeah. But just sort of, could you just tell us a little bit more around the data recording, um, how easy that is at lamin, and you know some of the practical hints and tips. <laughs> the outdoor lamin is a challenge, but um, with them being hilly hours, you don't have huge numbers of lambs. You have quite a lot of singles, so you don't have huge numbers of lambs to do us that uh, at the start um pretty much swear those are one of the quieter sorts of the uh, hill breeds as well that, that i've dealt with so they're usually pretty good to get close to to scan with a reader uh we've also used that using larger management tags in, as well as the id that's that you can read visually the uh, bigger flag tags because in the race so you can read the last four digits if there's a use stood over a lamb it's very important to be on in good time before the lamb can get up and run away with its mother so you have to be you know, once a day checking usually uh and go around and um we usually um check each batch once a day and then record as we go around do them and then move the ewes that haven't lambed out to that field and then start again it next paddock and move them off like that but um usually uh, a stick reader is usually required to read the eid number or a flag or read the uh, management flag tag but they're then, if if they are particularly wild, we we usually ring them. You can't get anywhere near them. We usually ring the tails of that ring the tail of that lamb, so that it's identified that it's not been recorded and it won't go into the nucleus breeding flock. So and it also that's a one way of breeding them a little bit more quieter to handle. Uh, if you've got particularly wild sheep, it's not a trait that I uh, value. Uh, <laughs> she might be she might be a really good mother and come back to a lamb, but if I can't get near enough to record it. It's quite handy that um, if you can breed them a bit quieter just for this job, it's not a. We'll keep them and um, put them to a put them to an inside tub as opposed to the pure swirldale again. The, okay. But it's a mark that shows up throughout the life. Yeah, thank you, Barry and Tim. How how do you deal with birth weight? How we um, at the start of the project, we uh, we talked to Steve Dunkley about this that um, weighing every lamb was not going to be practical. On a, in a hill situation, um, especially when your lamb singles away from the farm, uh, not easy to to get hold of at times. Um, and Steve Dunkley I had a word with Steve West, who was the the guy at the time that was that was running the, that side of it, and and he said that we could run a system where we call them small, medium, or large, which we would weigh the first few and then and then go by a system where if they're around two and a half, three kilo, we call them small. If they're between three and four kilos, we call them medium. And if they're above four, we call them large. Um, so you don't physically have to weigh every lamb, uh, but you do have to get its birthday. It's uh, the date of birth. Um, we we uh, We've always, well, for quite a lot of years, we've lambed our twins inside and penned them up so they're easy to record because um, selling tups, it's very important we have the breeding right. So we pen them up and they're tagged before they leave the pen. Um, this year, we've actually lambed all the twins outside, but we've still managed to, um, we've walked them into paddocks on uh, certain days. We've walked the sheep out there to lamb. And we have a mobile system set up where we're walking the walking them in and getting them tagged. And I think um, it's very important. We need to know the breeding of these lambs before there's any uh, mix-up, should we say? So I think it makes you more organised. Uh, we have them in smaller lots. Would Sarah uh, agree with that? Would she? <laughs> <laughs> I'm talking outside the house. <laughs> <laughs> But yeah, it 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 fo focuses the mind. But if you, it's like anything. If you want to do it, you'll do it. Yeah, it, yeah. If you want the results, you'll do it. And and as somebody that sort of became involved with the project, it's it it's 
I mean, there's a nice as possible sense, but you've all got better at it <laughs> um, yeah. as the time's yeah. gone on. So I think that that shows that one, the data that you're getting back off it is worth <laughs> worth any hassle it is. And two, practice does make perfect. So well done for that. That's right. um, That's right. a, great, a, a great question that's come in. Would you compromise on type if you were to get a, if you were sure you were going to get a better carcass? Yes, I would because I can. You can always put one mm. cross through it, and then of course you can always uh, breed back to type if you wish further down the line. If you think of it as a timeline, you could use uh, something to get a better carcass trait in the short term, and then cross back onto something that's more typey further down the line to get back into that breeding. Is always a give and take. And you've got to, it's um, at the moment growth rates and, ter and terminal traits are quite high up. I can all, you can always breed back to a, a tub that you like the look of a lot more in the next generation to fetch it out, the hours back right. So I would say, yes, I would, uh, to a certain degree, yes. Okay, Tim? I'm, I'm the other way. <laughs> I, like to, I like to stick to type. I want, I want, to, I want my Swaledale shape to be typey shape at the end of the day. But as luck would have it, most of our highest performing tubs are the most typey shape and getting... Is that luck? I don't know. It just seems to be how it's worked out, but it, it's uh, whether we're just fortunate. But um, the, the tubs with the highest figures have been our better looking shape, uh, which can be surprising at times, but uh, I, I certainly wouldn't want to drop my type um you know I, I use it as a tool not a rule but um there's big benefits to be had you, you can have both definitely i think you've been quite careful within the project as well haven't you tim to make sure the rounds that you are testing are ones that you would use anyway yeah that's right i mean uh, obviously we're all members of the swelldale association and we want to we want to stick to the rules and make sure that all these tubs that we're selling are up to breed standard, uh, fit for registration. So that is one way I'm hoping we can try and get more members involved in the future um, by sticking sticking to the rules of the breed. And just um, sort of um, the same question, but um, do you feel that as a group you're going to have to um, to increase genetic diversity, are you going to have to go outside of the group to get rams or get those genetics in? I mean, all, yeah. all the time, we're, we're, we're always buying new new tubs all the time, but obviously we're, we're buying blind at the minute. I mean, we have traded, a few tubs have been traded within the group. There are tubs that some of us have bred that others are using, um, but it would be nice to go to other tub sales and to be, have the choice of recorded tubs. Yeah. But yeah. Uh, we're just buying blind at the moment. Yeah. Okay. Um, I've got a question around body condition scoring. Kate, if I don't ask that, can you remind me to ask you that? Because I know we're going to come to health a bit later on, aren't we? Um, yeah. And then just just finally, whilst we're, we're talking in this section, um, Barry, a quick question for you. Do you feel breeding for quiet mother inability, you'll lose some of the hardiness of the swale? And um, is there any, for either of you, uh, Tim, probably you could answer this one, have there been any challenges reading and interpreting the data that you get? Barry, I don't know if you want to go first with that Sorry, well, mother inability I'm one. Again. Yeah, so do you feel breeding for a for a quiet mother inability that you lose some of the hardiness of the swale no not necessarily no just because that she's not doesn't disappear across the field the first the first chance she gets doesn't necessarily reduce the uh, the um her ability to rear a lamb on heaven moorland i don't think no um just because she's um i'm not breeding something that uh, will follow you around most of our sheep, or once they've got a lamb, will disappear off quite happily with them. Well, as soon as the lambs were able to get up and run away, to be honest. Yeah. So I don't. And, think do, that, you, I don't... and do you deal with the ewe lambs a little bit differently, or? Um, our um, shearlings, we tend to. Yes. Um, we, at the moment, that's the system we run next year. I think we'll probably start to score them out of five on how how um how quiet they are uh, just it's just a just a sideline it won't be a main breeding point it's just something along the lines 
it won't be uh, something that will go into the index. It's just something for our own records. We won't necessarily try and breed something that's uh, like a lap dog, but um, we will just bear it in mind that um, you don't want anything. That would, you've got to have good mothering ability, and sticking to its lamb is one of those traits that I quite, I quite I hold quite highly. Yeah. Okay. Great, thank you. And Tim, just yeah, just just the just the last question then for Tim, and then we'll move on. And any others I've missed, I'll try and catch up. But just, do you have any problems or any challenges reading and interpreting the data? The data, as it as it comes in, it, it comes in the format of this book from Signet. It is, uh, believe me, from a hill farmer's point of view, it is easy to understand. And when you when you see that some of the figures, you just want to read it more. And it, uh, it is good, good to read. Yeah, easy to understand. It's all there. All your figures are, everything's there. What you need. So Sam's gone. So I think she's run out of questions. Um, <laughs> coming back to one of the points that was raised in the questions, actually, um, it, within this project, one of the aims has been to improve the weather lambs. But at the end of the day, a swale needs to st stay a swale and it needs to stay a maternal breed. How are you ensuring that if you're focusing on growth and carcass? The, um, the index of the swale is also quite, isn't just a terminal index. It also takes into account mothering ability and milkiness and its ability to mother a lamb. Um, we were very careful when we put together put listed what are the traits that we were wanting that goes into the index that mothering ability wasn't compromised it wasn't that we were trying to breed texels with a black face with horns that go on the moor we were trying to breed something that was firstly a maternal sheep but we were just trying to tweak the um, terminal traits of it just to try and improve the carcass and growth rates of them we weren't wanting to do away with the milkiness as the eight week weight is quite crucial for the uh, a quite crucial for the um, for the um, eight week EBV and also the maternal EBV. It's one of the uh, that uh, that ability for the lamb to grow on its mother on whatever system you use, heather or grass, whichever it is. Um, but it's very important that uh, that's the that bit of data is the one that helps with mothering ability and how 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 she can rear a lamb. It obviously the data is takes into account the age of the ewe and obviously the difference whether it's a single or a twin. You've already informed signal of this and the um, the uh, the computer will run that through so that it'll 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 fiddle out those twins that are whether that are a bit smaller but the ewe might be milking just as hard as a single ewe but they obviously split it between two lambs instead of just one so we 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 rate mothering ability quite highly and its ability to milk milkiness also quite highly so it's still staying fairly high up on the list then it's still a priority definitely yeah well uh, it is it is definitely yeah mothering ability is one of the one of the main ones I look down when I look down the list to see, especially where the ewe lambs are performed. Definitely. So, Tim, um, there's both a time cost and a financial cost to you collecting this data. Is it worth it? For me, uh, we've been recording our swales now since 1988, as in the breeding of them. So we know the parentage of our sheep for all these generations of sheep. It seems a lot of that recording goes to waste in a way. With this information, we build on it and learn so much more from it. So we've been doing that recording anyway. The recording we're having to do on top of that is minimal. And the fact that you start weighing your lambs is good practice and it focuses the mind and when you've weighed them once, you want to get them in again and weigh them again and see how they're doing. Whereas in years gone, you just rode around the field and decided whether you thought they were doing all right or just standing still. Whereas now when you you get them weighed and, and uh, you get your data and it tells you, it tells you, and obviously there's patterns, some tups are coming out a lot better than others. So I think it's well worth the effort and cost. So would you say as pedigree breeders then, regardless of what breed it is, that by actually being a pedigree breeder, you're already what 50, 60, 70 percent of the way there? What would you what would you think? I would think I would think we're a we're a long way for for the for the little bit of time we've been running this project, I think we're we're a long way there. Um 
we've identified tubs that are at the top and we've identified poor ones. So you can make your decisions before next tupping time straight away. So surely uh, we're a long way there by then. After that, it's just a case of building on it. Sam, before we move off breeding, have you got any other questions coming through? Yeah, just, um, sorry, <laughs> just not not so much a question, just but a lot of support for the information um, that you guys have, have started to collect through the project. Um, a couple of messages around encouraging you guys as Swaledale breeders to get, get the information out to other farmers um, because genetic improvements is a game changer, is one comment that's been made. So, um, and I know we, 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 we've been trying to support you with that as well. And anybody that can help us to do that, please, please do feel free to, uh, to give me a ring. Um, so yeah, we, we, we would love to. And I think Tim, as the chairman of the group, I think you're, you're really um, keen to do that as well, aren't you? And you've, you've spoken yeah. at some great events to, to sort of bang the drum as it were. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. we'll, we'll continue that hopefully. Um, just a question around, do you see any opportunity to sell tups, um, so sell breeding stock and sell your lambs, dare I say, at a better price as a result of what you've been doing in the project? Yeah, yes, so. yeah. I think, go on, go on, Barry, you can answer this one. <laughs> yes, hopefully so. The, um, the, um, Sorry, the um, we've um, we've quite a few tubs that we've kept back. We've kept um, from we've kept um, some shearling homebred tubs of our own that have been highly regarded to breed for ourselves. But we've also started breeding breeding some to sell. I've had I've uh, I've had I've had one out on loan um, with a idea that it was a higher a higher growth rate tub, and I wanted I asked the farmer to mark the lambs that were by this tub lamb. And just to keep an eye on it, not recorded as such, he wasn't going to go down the full recording route, but just to take note when they finished in relation to his other lambs. So there is interest out there, and yeah, hopefully they should. Um, people should start to see the improvement of a of an increase of a high um, high EBV tub with uh, just on for the terminal trade. Definitely, um, I think that um, there's definitely a market out there for um, highly recorded tubs, especially. Um, not just within the Swerdo Society, but maybe uh, further afield as well. Yeah, good. Tim, have, have you, do you see an op any, any opportunity for the lambs? I see, uh, I, see, I definitely see opportunities for selling, like most Swaledale tups are sold as tup shillings. Um, I see an opportunity for selling those, because obviously they've come through the system as tup lambs. Um, not many Swaledales are used as tup lambs. To, to sire lambs, unless they're maybe often a, a very good showy type lamb that might get used on a few. Um, but shearlings, we sold a few shearlings last autumn, and I would say two or three of them definitely made more money because they were recorded tups. Um, so yeah, I, I see, I see a future for it. I do. Good, good. And just um, quickly, I'll, I'll ask these last two questions before uh, moving on because they're probably fitting well. But does the group find differences between tight walled ewes compared to the lo looser coated ewes? And are you monitoring your empty sheep? So I don't know if, if um, <coughs> one of you want to take one question and the other the other. Well, um, this year our empty sheep were so fat, so that was the uh, that was easy, <laughs> so they easy, were easy, easy one to answer. Yeah, we call if possible we call out as many uh, geld yows that we can, um, as uh, we want yow we want yows, especially shearlings, to get themselves in lamb first year if we can, and so we uh, we send those call. So I think the question was around um, you know fertility, obviously, and and do we see a problem? Do you see any you know from a practical point oh, of view very can... uh, we sort of try i as a rule i like to in our hill flock um about seven percent if we can keep uh gel deals under seven percent i think that's about a reasonable rate for a hill flock like are you, for the lowland flock we usually go on about three percent and um yeah we uh, if there if we're within that sort of range i'm quite happy that the fertility of our tubs we have fertility tested tubs before 
just to check that they work all right. And um, yeah, they haven't seen any problems with that. They're, we're usually within our parameters for Gale Cheap, to be honest. Okay, good. Tim, and the question around um, wool? <laughs> yeah, well, I, I, I do prefer the sheep with less wool, to be fair, because we're breeding the, the, the mule gimelam. Um, but obviously, we do have some sheep with what I would say too much wool. Uh, I haven't noticed a massive difference at the moment, uh, but most tubs we buy do have less wool, I would say. They are less open fleeced. Right. Um, okay. So, yeah, I, I think tight coated sheep, maybe while some of them look a bit leaner, I think that, that tight wool does actually turn the weather better. Um, and going on to lay, um, empty sheep, we're in a very hard part of the North York Moors. Our moor is very hard black heather where we will struggle to average a lamb per yow in a good year. So getting a, the percentage of geld ones, if we can get it down below, as Barry says, 7%, we're, we're quite happy. Um, okay. But it's very hard, very hard more. So that's why we wanted to do this project on a hard more, and then we we yeah. get some genuine, genuine results. Okay, good. Thank you, Tim. I've got some questions about the performance of the lambs, um, but we'll leave those to later on because I know you're going to come on to that, Emma. Is that all right? So we've got a body condition score and some finishing questions to come. All right. Okay. Thank you. Thanks, Al. So Kate, hello. Hello. We're going to move on to the health side of things now. So what have the group done um, differently with their health and management protocols? Well, of course, with, with swapping tops, they had to be very careful about the health state of the rams before they moved um, from farm to farm. So they were all given a very thorough MOT. Um, they were tested for borders disease and Visna um, and given quarantine treatments um, well, before they were treated for sheep scab, before they went to the farm um, next farm, and they were dosed with Zolvix. So um, they were very, very carefully monitored, um, and making sure that um, we weren't mixing diseases between the farms that were sharing the tubs. So that was something really, really important. Um, so I don't know, Tim, if I missed something there, or um, Barry. I mean, you two shared tubs, didn't you? Yeah, well, we, we, we run sheep on the same open hill, so to our flocks do mix naturally anyway. Yeah. But, um, yeah, we, uh, we've we changed changed a few health things. We off scratch for off before they go out to the moor now, whereas we never, and just to avoid any knock after we've weaned lambs, we don't want any uh, anything to knock them. Uh, we're later with our um, vaccinations for hepatitis P because we previously vaccinated at the eight week now we don't vaccinate to just before weaning and then after weaning just because uh or because just practicalities of gathering the more you never get them all so we we um we didn't uh, we were jabbing them turning them back out to the more for the first jab and then you maybe wouldn't get them for the second jab or you would miss them the first jab and then they would only get one jab and you would lose track of where and so we get a few losses that way so we we knocked on head and took the chance that on open more that we don't jab them for up to back there. And so that was a, that was a change that we do, and we started um, weaning a little bit earlier as well uh, from the management side. Yeah. How about you, Tim? Did you what else did you change? You've done some fecal egg counting on lambs as well, haven't you? Yeah, <clears throat> yeah. The the big change we did, uh, Kate, was the fact that we. We used to wait till after our meal gimme lamb sales before we gathered our moor to wean our swell lambs, which quite often got towards the end of September before we got them weaned. Well, now we leave shearing a little bit later and leave them in and wean them before we turn them back out after shearing. So they get weaned about the second week in August now. Um, that has massively improved our shape and the health of them. Um, the, the vaccinations are given at, at different times to what we used to. We're, we're getting them more accurate now. Um, and we just try and minimise the handling, which Swelldales are quite happy with that. Um, but the more you handle them, the, the more they don't like it. Um, but yeah, it, it's the weaning. Weaning earlier is the big one that, that we've altered. 
Yeah, because they don't seem to be as stressed taking it earlier. It does seem to be quite a difference in terms of mortality, doesn't it? I think I think the one for us with being on such a hard black moor where there's nothing but heather and bracken, once the heather starts to go back, these Swelldale lambs find it easy to go back in condition with it. So if mm -hmm. you leave them out there too long, um, it's too big a change from coming off really hard moor onto your in by grass. Whereas if they can come in in August when they're actually in quite good, as good a nick as they're pretty much going to be, and if you can get them used to your grass then um, with the least stress possible, that's that's the best time for us by, by our country mile. Yeah. So you're not seeing a big check in growth. It's a much tr smoother transition to being after, after weaning, basically. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Yeah. OK. Emma, did you want me to talk about the lamb, the finishing lambs or you come on to that as an aspect? Um, just, just the health and management changes you've made to them. Yeah, that'd be great. Please. Well, I think um, both Tim and Barry finished lambs at home and so did Lewis, another member of the group. Um, but one other member of the group also sent lambs away to be finished. He proved to himself it was costing him far too much to finish them at home um, and thought it'd be better to send to a um, specialist finisher. Um, but the specialist finisher was very um, concerned about buying Swaledales because the mortality rates were very high and probably relate to some of the things that Tim and Barry have been saying about them being weaned late, they having already sunk in condition maybe on the hill and then coming <coughs> down onto very good fields um, and lower ground and actually it was all too much and too stressful for them. So um, the earlier weaning is probably a very good idea to actually ease that weaning stress. But also um, on this particular farm um, that sent 500 lambs off to a specialist finisher, we put in place a very strict um, sort of health and welfare protocol to make sure these animals were as well protected as possible once they were weaned um, in terms of clostridial vaccines um, or um, uh, pasturella, um, uh, what else, trace elements, um, worming, um, just to make sure they were absolutely as fit as they could possibly be before they went to the finishing farm. Um, and it certainly paid dividends when they went there. Um, the farmer already had a very good sort of standard anyway, but um, both farms, the receiving farm and the original farm, really took great care of these animals to reduce and minimise the stress they were actually going to have to endure over that sort of move from home to the finishing farm. And that really did improve the mortality rates because the finisher was very sceptical and it almost said, I'm going to give up on buying swale dells anymore because I lose too many of them. But I think this sort of really good health protocol the management system that was put in place really did minimize the losses and um, improve the health of the animals right through the winter so it was worth the extra cost of doing that then yeah i think for everybody yeah i think the, the lambs coming from the, the original farm um i don't know what money changed hands emma but um, i'm sure he'd be paid a bit more because the mortality was um lower and um, the uh, finishing farm got a better quality animal, which was more likely to survive a tough winter and a new diet. So yeah, I think very beneficial for all round, really. Brilliant. Sam, did you have more questions and your BCS question as well? Yep, yeah, so just uh, one question around weaning. Um, what is your normal mortality rate in swear lambs after weaning? You guys know what the, that is? I don't know the exact figure. We certainly had um, less mortality weaning earlier and giving the, giving the lambs more chance to get used to just a grass diet, basically. We, when we weaned, we fetch, again, we shear like Tim when we wean. Um, we leave the ewes and the lambs in for as long. We try and save some grass up to get, fetch them in onto so that the lambs are still on their mothers while, for a, and while they've been jabbed and try and leave them on the mothers. We try and keep them in for about a week to get them used to having the vaccine while they're still on the mothers and then let them give them a day or two just to settle down for that and then wean them and shear the ewes and turn the back to them more and then that just gives the lambs a chance a bit of, a bit of time to get used to eating grass before we take them off while we have the mean for shearing the lamb all the time the lambs are getting used to eating um eating grass as opposed to heather so mm -hmm. just that just to, just to try to slowly 
just to give them a chance rather than fetching them straight enough and more, wean them and then turn the ewes back out. And then you're expecting the lambs to do without their mother, usually get a jab, uh, a vaccine, and then also a change of diet, which was upsetting them. So we try and make the transition a little bit more, mm. bit, a little bit easier now. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah they're a, a bit yeah. treating them with kit gloves, really, isn't it? You know, with these swear lambs. Mm, um, yeah. And and yeah. I think that the, the the guy, you know, the the sort of finisher farm, Kate was really quite surprised, wasn't he, at how much of a change there was in mortality? I mean, he really was shocked, wasn't he? Um, yeah, he was very very got, pleasantly surprised. I think Sam. Yeah, <laughs> very, yeah, yeah, he was. Yeah, yeah. Um, Tim, have you got any any other? He, sorry, Tom, sorry, I was just going to say there are yeah. certainly some some breeders that you wouldn't want to buy lambs from because of high mortality yeah. rates. Whereas um, this particular breeder, you know, had a very good reputation for keeping lambs alive, but it was largely because of the good handling before they left the farm. Yeah, the yeah. good treatments. Absolutely, yeah. And sometimes it wasn't necessarily an increased cost, was it? It was just doing things in a different order, um, maybe leaving longer time between treatments and things like that, wasn't it? It wasn't, um, yeah, it, it wasn't chucking the kitchen sink at these lambs, was it? No, definitely not. It was doing what was appropriate rather than um, going overboard, yeah. definitely. It was an in, yeah. a very good insurance policy, I would say, um, probably yeah. to secure a slightly higher um, sale price for the store lamb. Um, and of course, the, the, you know, the finisher was getting a better quality lamb and far more um, livability. Yeah. Yeah, cool. Tim, have you, do you track any mortality rates just before I ask a question around... Well, I would say I would say with the since we've been weaning earlier, um, I wouldn't say we've lost. We used to lose loads, but I would say the mortality rate has gone down slightly. But the big difference is the amount of condition those lambs keep now, whereas years mm. years years past, a lot of those lambs they wouldn't die, but they would lose a lot of condition. So you were actually right. losing a lot of flesh without losing shape. Whereas yeah. now those lambs are holding that condition. And as long as you, when you bring them in, I mean, we, we only have sheep on our farm. So our in by ground has had sheep on it. So when we bring our more sheep in, those more lambs are hitting ground that has already had sheep on. So fake leg counting is, is very important for us. Yeah, yeah, no, that's good. Mm -hmm. um, so just um, just a question around body condition score then. Will increased growth rate of weathers and also presumably ewe lambs lead to an increase in mature, mature ewe body size? Yeah, if not monitor, yes, it would do. But um, weighing shearlings just before they go to the top, uh, just to keep a check on um, mature size, as a, you, can, you, um, keep, you can have a mature size EBV. So you can keep a check on bit breeding faster growing sheep will be bigger, bigger bigger sheep, but if you keep a, if you purposely choose high growth rates and lower mature size, you're gonna uh, compact faster growing animal. Okay. Tim, anything to add to that or I think the, the swelled ale is naturally a, a medium sized shape, a medium to small size shape. I don't and we're definitely not trying to make it into a, a terminal shape. Um yeah. so yeah. There isn't a Swelldale tup out there that's going to breed all his yows at 80, 90 kilos, uh, and that, that just that just won't happen. Um, the, uh, again, I, I go back to the the other end of the scale. Let's get rid of those that are that are getting the really poor ones. Um, I don't think the the top ones are, are to worry about. I think the other end is to worry about. <laughs> you know, concentrate on the good ones. But I I'd, I can't see, although the shape. They're maturing. We're, I mean, we're selecting them so they carry more fat throughout uh, throughout their their life. That's what we're selecting them for. Um, I'm not sure it's going to make them grow into massive shape because the breed just it, that every every sheep has its capacity. Right. Okay. Good. And it's not right. just fat, is it, Tim? It, it's actually muscle too. We're getting better muscle depth, aren't we? So it's it's muscle and yeah. fat, isn't it? We're getting more of. So we've got a better confirmation lab at the end of the That's day. Right. Yeah. That's right. That's right. Yeah, yeah. We're looking for that extra meat. But uh, if mm. we can if we can identify ones that can carry most fat throughout the season, that that uh, that fits the bill for us guys. Yeah. yeah. Good. Yeah. 
Okay. All right, Emma. Thanks, Sam. Actually, my next question um, follows on really nicely from that point, Tim. Are you actually seeing lambs that are finishing quicker and are you getting better grades and weights? I realise you're only three years in, but... Yeah, of course, yeah, we're only three years in. It, it, it's a short, uh, it's been a short project really, but we're obviously going to carry on. But but yeah, the data we've had back from the, the killing out sheets that we've, that we've got back, uh, very encouraging. We did some dissection work and, and Kate will be able to give all the information on this, but but yeah, uh, we have a certain tub that's performing really well. These lambs are killing out heavy, good grades, better grades than than tubs that uh, are the low index tubs. Um, so yeah, and these lambs have finished quicker. I mean, all the data's there. Kate may have the the graphs to to show that, but yeah. It, it, just tie in with your fastest growing ones are the ones that went quickest and actually gave the better grades. Well, maybe come naturally to Kate then now and ask you to ask you to talk about this slide a little bit. Okay. Well, the, these are Tim's um, rams. If you just look at the bottom line, you can see the numbers of the rams um, on the bottom of this, each of the graphs. Um, and the top graph is actually days to slaughter. So you can see we have a range within that graph of 200 and about 275 days for Ram 9344 to as many as about 318 days for Ram 4116. Now, Tim basically um, had a number of his, his um, weather and Ram lambs and finished those at home on, uh, ad, well, it worked up to ad-lib concentrates and haylage, and they were finished indoors, these animals, and then we obviously monitored growth rates on these animals and then they were actually sent off to slaughter at Dunby at Preston where we actually got the carcass weights and the carcass confirmations and then we also um, were doing some carcass dissection so we have measurements of um, gigot and um, loin length and lots of other measurements we took on the carcasses from selected um, sires. So you can see we've got a very big difference in days to slaughter and as many of you will know, the shorter a period a lamb is on the farm, the more efficient it is. So it's actually growing faster. The other good thing, if you look down at the bottom left hand corner, everyone, that graph shows the um, confirmation of the lambs. So we've got O grade, which is pretty typical for a Swaledale. But what we've been trying to do with this project is move more lambs into our confirmation, getting better shape of carcass, so more muscle and a little bit more fat on these animals. Um, and you can see, um, again, Ram 9344 um, had a reasonably high proportion of R grade carcasses and they finished quicker. And you can see um, on the bottom right hand graph of this page, that is carcass weight. And many of you might not believe that those are Swaledale carcasses that Tim's finishing there at above 19 kilos for Ram 9344. So you can see we've got a big range in carcass weight. We've got Ram 1599 at just above 17 kilos, um, going up to the best Ram in this selection of, of data um, at over 19 kilo carcasses. So showing what great potential there is in the swale, and we've got the full range within each of these graphs, showing um, better growth rates, shorter days to slaughter, better conformation, and um, heavier carcass weights. So showing huge benefits in terms of what these rams are able to deliver in terms of um, the male lambs. And hopefully that will mean, um, you know, higher value to the store finisher if we're selling as stores, and certainly a higher value to Tim in terms of pence per kilo dead weight that he should have been paid. Did you see that coming through, Tim? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You definitely get more money, obviously, for your lambs if they're heavier and the and the grade better. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, so, so it's it, you know from that perspective, this project has really achieved what we wanted it to to identify these rams that are sort of doing exceptionally well. And you can see very clearly which Tim would probably cull out um, based on some of this data we've got here. Brilliant, Tim. I'm going to ask you a bit of a mean question now. If you had to um, estimate what the value of the improvements you've made are you do you have a rough idea of what that would be uh, 
it's hard to quantify, but as Kate as Kate explained on the on the graph on the bottom right, uh, the lambs by nine three four four average two kilos dead weight heavier than the, the ones by the worst getting tough. So that alone this year would would equate to approximately ten pound a lamb. Yeah, that's just would. that's that's just the help on your weather lamb. Then you've got mm. your improvements on your female sheep and mm. your improvements on your yeah. mules out of your yows and so yeah quite quite a good value would be able to put on that i would have thought and then you've got mm. because they've gone lambs by that tub have gone to kill sooner you've got feed savings you have yeah they would and the other thing that tub got as well tim they got a lot more lambs didn't he in the first place it, yeah that's true got an awful lot more lambs so overall we should work that out shouldn't we of what actually he gained over your worst one it would be quite an interesting calculation to work through wouldn't it in terms of number of lambs size of lambs payment per kilo based on an r rather than o confirmation um and all that would add up to quite a significant amount i would suggest um was this 9344 ram one with good figures yes he's got good high index figures yeah and, he, and he's, he's all, quite and, typey too. And yeah, he's also <laughs> he's also a very a very typey too. So I'm very happy with him. He's also alive. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> absolutely. Will be for a long time, I hope. Which for sheep is pretty I'm sorry, sorry. I'll stick to the questions, not the comments. <laughs> <laughs> question, what is it? Yeah, question. Um is muscle depth scanning worth it? Can we see any you get any pounds in your pockets for doing that? The um, the depth muscle depth actual EBV the depth uh, there's a correlation between that and the total muscle on carcass. Uh, it's maybe a bit early to say whether they actually grade better on the Europe bit or not, but they're certainly um, having a better chop. Surely should kill out better. Um, uh, processors currently grade on the Euro grade rather than killing out percentages. So, but um, having more. There's definitely a correlation between the uh, muscle depth EBV and the amount of muscle on a carcass. So surely uh, more muscle on the carcass has to be a good thing. Okay. Yeah. Tim, anything to add to that or? No, uh, exactly what Barry said. Obviously, the, the deeper okay. the muscle, the more muscle you've got on the animal, you've got more meat, uh, you're likely to get a better confirmation. Good. It's going to be do, much do more you... appealing to the um, processors, isn't it, as a, as a lamb, because cask muscle yield will be greater. So, um, you know, it, it will be, yeah, desirable, a more desirable carcass. And certainly when in the abattoir, when we were doing that um, muscle dissection, um, the processor was very happy with the majority of swales that went in on that day. And I think we took in something like 220 for um, slaughter that day. And the large majority of them, they were very happy that we, they would fit the um, retail specs that they have. Okay, great. And do, do either of you finish top um, entires? Do you do any entire lambs? Yes, any... all our lambs are left entire. Yeah, they're, so... Uh, they're basically, yeah. mainly because, um, just to give everything, don't prejudice against uh, any animal when it's born, just on breeding, just give it on the, everyone an equal chance to prove themselves throughout the season. Okay. Also, you also get uh, faster growth rates. Okay. Yeah. Good. Um, and Kate, did did what interesting question here around the data analysis against twins and singles? Anything to say on that? Um, there were a lot. Well, some rams certainly um had a lot more um twins um than others. Um, but we didn't divide those in terms of the carcass comp information and fat class um, and, um what we did notice uh with specialist finisher is this a good point to bring that in about what we found yeah. with those lambs um yeah. 500 lambs from one of the one of the group members were sent to the specialist finisher and um uh, it was very interesting before christmas we were looking at the growth rates and and the, the finisher wanted lambs above 25 kilos when they arrived he didn't want any tiny lambs because he thought they might have caused him more problems and be more likely to die than a larger, more robust lamb. Um, but before the, these lambs were put onto a diet, um, a combination diet, when they first arrived, they're just on grass and then they gradually transition onto um, grazed fodder beet with the grass. 
um, is just in a strip at the side of the field. Um, they're given ad lib haylage and they're also given a um, course mix in a um, three in one feeder. Um, so um, they make this transition, but monitoring growth rates before Christmas, um, the, the lambs hardly grew at all even though they had a really luxurious diet, um, certainly compared to Black Heather um, and Black, uh, Black Hill. Um, so um, uh, it was quite apparent that they were only going to be, they were growing at about, on average, only about 35 grams a day, which was a pretty poor growth rate given the, the really uh, you know, good diet that was in front of them. But a lot of it to do with, with stress of moving and, and um, uh, you know just size of lamb because it had actually appeared when we analyzed the data that the smaller lambs were growing faster than the bigger ones the bigger lambs that range the lambs actually in, in in the event range from 23 kilos to about 40 kilos and it was the 40 plus kilo lambs that were losing weight in that pre-christmas period and the little ones were growing on better so the little ones were growing at over 60 grams a day and some of the big ones were actually losing weight and I think that might come back, Sam, to the fact that these lambs, um, the twin-born lamb is having to make its way rather earlier on grazing um, than a single-born lamb. And we think that was more capable of coping on its own than a single-born lamb. Um, so we feel that that was probably um, those twins actually being pretty robust in terms of going forward because they'd had to fare for themselves at an earlier age. Um, but interestingly, after Christmas, um, all of the lambs started growing at a sensible pace and they were growing at about 125 grams a day post Christmas to finish. Um, they were gradually eating more and more concentrates and they obviously got over the stress of being moved um, and a, a really, you know, were, were using the diet properly. It was before Christmas, there was a feeling in that particular year that um, they were eating, but they weren't putting it anywhere. They were just eating it and not, not depositing it on their backs. Um, but um, it was interesting and the feeling was that probably with those animals there is a, possibly an effect of the shortening day length um, related to appetite and intake so um, the, the finisher who's now sort of carrying on buying Swaledale lambs because he's had some good experiences in the last couple of years um, now doesn't even introduce concentrates to them at all pre-Christmas and he just puts them on forage and fodder beet um, and then brings in the home mix um, post-Christmas which they seem to cope with much better. So and that, it's that'll again be a, a huge of, cost saving for him won't it? Absolutely because they weren't growing very well so what was the point of putting large amounts of concentrates in front of them yeah. um, but and then they seem to on, once the day length starts increasing again they seem to increase their appetite and away yeah. they go so um, but at home on Barry and Tim's farm they, they didn't seem to see those low growth rates not as much or as significantly because you obviously hadn't moved them um, to a different environment so they didn't have that check of, of a complete change in, in, in food and um, environment. So your growth rates, Tim, were really pretty good, I felt, uh, 140, 150 grams for your lambs finishing. And yours were something similar, Barry. I haven't got them in my head. But do you want to comment about your growth rates on the finishing lambs you did? Um, the growth rates, yeah, the... Um... Well, all our lambs were gone in good time this year after using ABV tubs. They were, uh, they were gone all by the 8th of uh, 8th of January. But, um, yeah, exactly. Yeah, they, yeah, hmm. they were uh, they definitely improved that way, like, yeah. How how, hmm. how did that compare to previous years, Barry? Uh, quite often uh, selling into March. Yes. Yeah, so March that's... and April. Yeah. Okay. We had sold some. We had sold them at lighter a lighter weight this year as well, just because there was a premium on light lamb earlier on and um, didn't want to push them through to the big heavier weights so we saw quite a few more lighter however but um, it just depends on what price what price things are mm -hmm. good all right that's it for questions from me emma thanks we can almost have a full meeting on that one <laughs> <laughs> um, i'm just going to move on a little bit to the reaction that you've had from the industry tim what reception to the project have you had from your peers and was it as you expected? Um, the reception we've had from Swelldale breeders to me has been really positive. I mean, in the, all three years of the project, we've had an open day each year. We've had a good turnout of people, all with very positive um, remarks. 
um, about the day. We've presented, I've presented this to the Swaledale AGM on two occasions. I never witnessed any negative feedback on the day. I've never heard any, you know, any bad feedback about that. Um, I would say it's been received very well on the whole. Yeah, very well. People are definitely watching and wanting to see the outcome and the results and obviously see where we're going further forward. What about yourself, Barry? Yeah, most people, the I did sell some age trucks that had been used within the project. We'd used them for far, four and five years. Um, and one was a very well recorded tub and one wasn't. And I put the EBVs on the gate and I had quite a lot of uh, interest in um, in what they meant and just uh, just explained them. And most people were very supportive. I had, a, I had, I had a, a good one and a bad one there that, on the figures. And just when you looked at them, there wasn't a lot between them. And just uh, just explaining how those figures had come by, there was a lot of people at the sale that were very that were interested in it. To be honest, uh, I think they've been very well received. To be honest. Yeah. Brilliant. So I'm going to come to all three of you then. Um, what would I'll come to Tim first? What would your top tips be? Um, and what would you want to pass on to somebody else? What would you encourage them to do or not do? My top tip would be be patient because what we've learned in three years is a lot. Uh, whereas obviously to, to make any difference with the breeding in sheep, you want at least two generations of sheep. Well, that's 10 years. So what we've achieved in three years, you know, identify your poems in year one, don't use those if you don't want to. That's that's a massive step forward. That's my tip. The the the, the figures, the index figures, use them as a tool, not a rule, but very very useful. That's that's my tips. Brilliant, Barry. Call out call out your poor performance. Call out your poor performance and cross out your average ones to your best, and just keep raising trying to raise your average. That would be my top tip. You can achieve a lot by getting rid of your poor ones as opposed to your, your uh, focusing on your high performer ones and you'll fetch your average up over your flock. Okay, yourself? Well, take these improved lambs and finish them and they can really meet current market specifications with no trouble. So, um, yeah, they're, it's, they're certainly not a byproduct. They can be a, a major output from um, Swaledale flocks. And you just jumped ahead of me <laughs> on that one. Sorry. That's, no, that's okay. That's the answer from you, Kate. Tim, by product or opportunity? Opportunity. <coughs> Definitely. Yeah. We we look at them totally different now to what we used to do. I mean, we used to obviously the Swaledale's main job is to breed the North of England mule. Well, that's the yow. The Swaledale weather lambs just used to be pretty much sold at the autumn for what price you got for them, whereas now uh, if you do the job right and they uh, buy the right tubs, they can create quite an income. Barry? Definitely an opportunity. There's a lot of rough grazing in this country that can't be improved, that need, requires a small compact hill you that's hardy and can rear your own body, that, and needs lambs that can fatten on better lowland ground. And I think the Swaledale ticks a lot of those boxes by being already very maternal. Uh, been not particularly large, so it doesn't need a lot of maintenance when they're grazing rough ground. But um, definitely an opportunity. Just need to get them so that they'll finish a little bit better and slightly better grade, and we'll have a, a ewe that will graze a lot of mountain and hill hill ground that other breeds uh, maybe a bit too large, or imported breeds are maybe a bit too large to graze. To be honest, and I feel that they'll still hit the bottom end of that um, Europe grid and the 15 to 17 kilo category on the weight quite easily brilliant mm -hmm. thank you all three of you sam have we got any questions that haven't been asked elsewhere just uh just a couple of comments really just around the project and and next steps um i'll sort of give a give a bit of a bit of a background with that. I mean, in, t in terms of the project, I think um, both Tim and Barry and other members of the group would would certainly be welcome and open to new opportunities, new entrants, more Swaledale flocks that would be interested in recording it. Am I right in saying that? Sort of putting you on the spot? Yeah, yeah definitely. Yeah, so, definitely. Always yeah, an open door for anyone that needs advice on it. 
Yeah, and um, mm. you know, a comment here around uh, getting more Swaledale breeders on board with this is 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 really really going to help um, push everything forward at a much quicker pace. We know we our expectations, I think, are right in terms of how long this is going to take. But certainly, the more involvement, I think, the better. So that's an open call for anybody listening to uh, to 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 really seriously think about it. Um, there was been some more questions around the finishing, which I haven't haven't had time to to ask tonight. So, if um you know if there is a desire to talk more in more detail about that, I'm sure Kate would be happy to join us again and and go through a bit more detail on the finishing. Yeah. Um. But Kate and I, we also mm -hmm. identified that you know there probably is room or or could have been room to do a specific finishing trial with this project. Well, we'd hope to do that. Yeah, we had yeah. Sam, hadn't we? Yeah. We'd hope to do that, but. To be honest, it was one step too far for everybody. They were doing plenty with um, data recording and, and genetic side of it. So we did very much monitor growth rate rather than do trials on different feedstuffs. So um, then maybe that's for another time if we could get some more funding to, to do yeah. that. Um, and now everybody's more used to the recording and it's not proving anywhere near as difficult as they thought it might. Um, uh, you know, there's scope to, to, to do more. So, yeah, hopefully, hopefully we can yeah. in the future now. Yeah, hopefully, because I think even the short, you know, that even the, the 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 parts that you shared with us there have, have given some really interesting results, haven't they? So yeah, we hope yeah. um, mm. we might be able to to, yeah. to do that. Just quickly, just a yeah. quick answer, Tim and Barry, do you do you finish your lambs indoor or, or outdoor? They're um, run on until we run out of grass, uh, and then slowly transitioned onto hard feed outdoor, and then fetched inside to be finished. Okay, and when you select them to go away, what what live weight are you looking for? Um, I look for anything over thirty six kilos that's oh, that that will grade. Okay, great. Tim, any, anything that, any different from you? We're on similar system to Barry. Basically, we run them on grass. We sometimes try and grow a bit of forage rape to help in sort of October, November, but uh, with the so we can't get the the seed treated now so the flea beetle kills all our forage rape so our swelldales spend all autumn on grass uh, we usually house them first or second week in december and then they okay. go straight onto hard the, the, that's when they get introduced onto hard feed they don't they don't get hard feed outside they just get uh, they'll get chance of haylage outside um but we just any changes we do gradual Okay, great. Um, Thank you. So, so that so that answers two of the, the questions. Emma was um, around the finishing side. We know there's room for room to do more, and we hope to do more. And um, that was identified from the project. We'd like to get more people involved, and we'd like to continue with the project, as I know the project group will do. And hopefully, there'll be you know that they're looking to sell rams in the future as well with recorded figures. Um, and then finally, there was just there was an element of the group that wanted to have a, a, a greater look at the maternal side as well, not ignoring the ewe, um, which we're, we're just exploring at the moment as part of the group. And then just finally, Emma, there's some questions around the availability of this webinar. Where will it be shared? Can they forward it to others to, to help spread help spread the messages? Yes, so I think everybody that has registered tonight will get a link with it on um, and within about 24, 48 hours, it'll be on YouTube. So when you go on and click on that link and find it on YouTube, you'll be able to forward it to whoever you like. Okay. And finally, just in terms of the project, the DEFRA report has been submitted. It hasn't yet been signed off, but when it is, um, I will happily load it to the website and have that thing done and dusted with. Um, but at the moment, it's just not quite there. But we can um, we can forward the link um, to that detail once once it's available to those that have registered for tonight, perhaps. And that that's it from me. Thank you very much. Brilliant. Thanks, Sam. And thank you um, to you, Tim, Barry and Kate as well. It's been fantastic. Um, I'm just going to move on quickly to talk about some of the resources that we have. So if you go on to AHDB Knowledge Library, you can look for any information on there, um, regardless of topic. If you can't find what you're looking for, please contact your um, area representatives because um, they'll probably be able to find it for you if you can't. 
just along with um, resources specific to tonight, in that knowledge library, we have buying a recorded RAM for maternal traits, buying a recorded RAM for terminal sires. Um, that just talks you through how to interpret figures. If you're looking for recorded sheep near you or just want to see what the charts that you get and the figures that you get with these um, animals looks like, please go to signetdata.com. Anybody can access that site who's got an internet connection. Um, and if you know the name of a breeder, you can look for their sheep. Um, we also already have the North York Moor Swaledale breeders, breeders page on the AHDB site. And just to flag to your attention that we have another one of these calls in a fortnight on Thursday, the 11th of June, same time, looking at sheep and whether weaning this year is profit for next year. So if you're interested, um, please go to the AHDB events page to find that. Um, I think after this, um call either i think it'd be about tomorrow you'll also get an email through asking for your feedback uh, we do use that to improve these events so please do let us know other than that i think we're about done so thank you very much for joining um have enjoy the rest of your evening thank you very much thanks Anne. thank, thank you. you bye 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 thank you